All right, here are some multiple choice questions in neurology. 69 year old male presents to the emergency department complaining of recurrent episodes of transient vision loss in his right eye for the past month. So question is, is this monocular visual loss or not? Right, monocular would be in front of the optic eye as some optic nerve or eye itself. And then uh, binocular or other visual loss will be behind optic chiasm. So he describes the episode as sudden and painless. So painless vision loss often is considered related to optic neuritis, while a painful vision loss in monocular or single eye will be intraocular or inside the eye. So there are sudden episodes. They last few minutes each time. He states that he experiences a shadow move down his visual field. So that's classical curtain coming down. Curtain coming down could be either a drop of retina, so retinal tear and then the retina falling down, or because here these are intermittent episodes, it will be likely a loss of blood flow. So blood drains the retina and then the, there's a curtain coming down. And these are episodic, meaning that they happen for a few minutes go away. So something is causing the blood flow to pause uh, to the eye intermittently, and then it resolves. So that could be intraocular uh, showering of small clots. Usually this is vascular or vascular embolic, meaning that uh, cholesterol deposits from the blood vessel wall, usually carotid are breaking off and going to the ophthalmic artery and causing these kind of monocular uh, visual loss. Examination currently, uh, 2020 vision, fundoscopy reveals no abnormalities, and there's no other focal neurological deficit. So you would want to do probably a carotid duplex ultrasound uh, to look for the carotid artery disease, or if you're worried about a stroke that has happened and resolved, you may want to do MRI of the brain because even if there are no focal neurological deficit, there may be infarcts in the brain that could be silent infarcts. So that may be uh, the first or carotid ultrasound, or you can do MRA of the uh, carotid artery for this. Uh, but really what you want to do, which is not here, it's look inside the eye. You want to do a fundoscopic examination. They're saying fundoscopy is normal, but uh, I would get a more dilated fundoscopic examination to make sure there's no signs of small infarcts in the retina or uh, retinal artery occlusion or something like that. These questions are written by my students. I'm just sharing here uh, for, for learning lessons from these. Uh, I have these students do question writing exercises uh, to try to get some idea of how a good question is written or, or what's going behind the mind of a question writer um, and, and options and distractors. And that's a good practice so that you can do better on questions examination. By the way, talking about multiple choice questions, one of the projects I'm working on is uh, using AI, uh, such as ChatGPT, uh, kind of LLMs to write questions. And so check it out on quizmd.ai. So Q-U-I-Z-M-D.ai, a tool to write questions and practice them. And you can critique those questions as a practice. Unlimited questions you can get from that. So let's see what the student answer. I haven't done these questions before, so let's see what the answer is. Carotid duplex ultrasound, really looking for the plaque. So my first suspicion was right. Uh, and I will go on next. 65-year-old male presents to the emergency department with sudden onset dizziness and difficulty walking. He reports a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, irregular, so not compliant with the medication. His blood pressure is 160-90, so slightly elevated. Heart rate is normal, respiratory rate is normal, neurologic examination reveals horizontal nystagmus. So in horizontal nystagmus usually is brainstem, cerebellar kind of involvement, bilateral limb ataxia. So it doesn't say upper or lower, but because there was gait abnormality, so at least lower, maybe both. Difficulty with tandem gait and bilateral dysmetria of finger to nose testing. So all cerebellar sign. So posterior fossa sign, a sudden onset is usually ischemic or stroke, but other things can happen. Sudden onset too. Uh, like trauma, sometimes uh, rupture of a uh, tumor can happen, sudden onset, um, and medication, toxicity, cerebellar toxicity can happen, sudden onset, uh, if uh, he overdosed on certain medication. Um, <clears throat> carbon monoxide poisoning can be sudden onset, can have posterior fossa, but there's no uh, concerns right now of such episode. Motor strength and sensations around intact reflexes are brisk throughout. So it's non-localizing. -local brisk reflexes doesn't mean anything. I would want to see a clear hyperreflexia. Just brisk is not enough. Brisk can be medication like serotonin or other medications can cause brisk reflexes. So which of the following physical examination findings is most suggestive of vertebrobasal and insufficiency of this patient? So vertebrobasal insufficiency meaning that there has to be ischemia of the cerebellar posterior fossa. So posterior fossa signs will be 
Um, Hemi Priest says no. That will be uh, uh, sh should not be basal or artery. Although Hemi Priest can happen, uh, but uh, Hemi Priest alone is usually not sufficient. Hyperreflexia alone is not sufficient. Unilateral facial weakness can be basal. Uh, Dysmetria to finger to nose is basal and ipsilateral pain. So I think out of these, I guess the question I'm just trying to ask that which of the following is an ataxia or cerebellar sign and the option should be D. But it's, it's a poorly constructed choices. Vertebral basal insufficiency, hemiparesis can happen with a basal infarct, right? Because brainstem infarct can give you hemiparesis, they can give you hyperreflexia, they can give you a unilateral facial weakness. So the, the when you're writing option choices, it has to be that nothing else fits exactly, although they are sound believable, but they should not be present. So either you define hemiparesis better or hyperreflexia better, in a sense that that cannot happen. So for example, you can say that Oh, the answer is dysmetria. So I was correct. But I think the distractors are not well written in this particular uh, question. 32-year-old woman undergoing chemotherapy with vincristin, deptomycin, methotrexate, and prednisone for unilateral ductal carcinoma in SEG2 presents to the emergency the history of 10 days of recurrent headaches, low-grade fevers, and cough. So immune compromised with very heavy toxin drugs. So vincristin, um, daptomycin, methotrexate, all significantly immune comp uh, compromising. Prednisone is likely being given to reduce the, some of the side effects from some of these medication uh, as they can cause inflammation, I'm guessing. When Kristen is neurotoxic, so it by itself can cause many things or damage, usually neuropathy, uh, but daptomycin also neurotoxic. Methotrexate will be the least so, but can cause ataxias. So recurrent he headache and low-grade fever raises concerns for infection especially with cough, My moderate nuchal rigidity, so concern is for now meningitis. Neurological examination reveals bilateral papilledema, so again, sign of increase in trachealic pressure. Increase in trachealic pressure in meningitis often is seen with um, fungal or bacterial meningitis, something that is causing a lot of uh, fluid formation. Lumbar puncture in CSF shows 70% lymphocytes, so that goes for fungal or viral meningitis. More than 200 cells goes more for fungal than viral. Uh, elevated protein again goes more for fungal and bacterial rather than viral. Low glucose goes more for bacterial and fungal rather than viral. And then ele significantly elevated, elevated blood pressure. So we usually measure them in centimeters of water. So centimeters of H2O or 28 is a very high elevated pressure, which will make me worry about fungal. Low grade fever goes with fungal with cough, so something like uh, a fungal uh, pulmonary infection that has now gone to meninges. So question, so it will be out of these, fungal is cryptococcus, so that will be my first uh, concern. Streptococcus is possible, but lymphocytes are less likely, although other things can happen, but again, elevated CSF is less likely, herpes simplex is unlikely, cytomegalovirus is unlikely, All of, both of these are viruses. So if I have to pick something, it will be cryptococcus. 31-year-old female presents to the emergency department with a continuous headache for past three weeks. On questioning, her headaches is worse in the morning, increases sharply when she coughs or sneezes. So coughing and sneezing increases your belly and then your lung pressure, so that gives back pressure on your CSF. So that could be uh, a headache that is worsening with coughing and sneezing uh, due to, uh, and worse in the morning makes me worry about some form of a CSF pressure alteration. So on fundoscopy, bilateral disc swelling is noted, so elevated CSF pressure. Three weeks of history, so not too long. Patient has not seen a doctor since immigration from Sri Lanka seven years ago. Blood pressure and heart rate is slightly elevated. Respiratory is normal. Neurologic examination reveals no abnormalities. MRI of the brain and spine shows no gross abnormalities, which are the following most likely to found further on this examination. So this is a two-step question, right? So you are supposed to figure out the diagnosis and then explain which of the following findings will be linked with that diagnosis. So let's think about diagnosis first. So this is this is um, a likely pseudotumor cerebri, 31-year-old, middle-aged female, uh, has elevated CSF pressure, signs, but no finding on MRI. So no meningitis, no nothing else, and no other focal neurological deficit. So increase in trachealic pressure, uh, headache, or ICH, uh, or pseudotumor cerebri. So pseudotumor cerebri will give you um, not estrexis, not resting tremor, not tongue abnormality, maybe a false localizing sign. So the, uh, difficulty abducting one eye or the other. They are called false localizing sign because when the intracranial pressure goes up, 
it pinches the sixth cranial nerve, so the abducens nerve, uh, onto the um, on, onto the edge of the dura as it goes from posterior fossa to the middle fossa. So there is the uh, uh, a ligament that is running from the posterior clinoid processes of the pituitary fossa, and that ligament uh, has like a tough edge. And the nerve transfer over, so it's a so abducens nerve is the longest nerve in the cranial nerve, uh, going from the brainstem all the way to the eye. And it has a path where it can be pinched against a ligament because of inter increased cranial pressure f pushing the soft tissue of the brain against it. And so I would say that D is likely the answer uh, for this. So I think very reasonably written question. Uh, Two-step question, you have to first figure out the, uh, the diagnosis and then link with it. So these are one of the hardest questions in step two. Uh, and uh, again, I'm going to uh, talk about the project I'm working on, the quiz MD.ai where you can actually generate these kind of two-step questions to practice on uh, to try to see how one step of figuring out diagnosis from a clinical scenario and then uh, second step uh, would be could be useful. All right, 62-year-old uh, male presents to the emergency department due to left-sided facial weakness that he first noticed 30 minutes ago. So 30 minutes acute left side facial weakness, 62. Speech is slurred, having difficulty closing his left eye. Uh, so could be the lower motor facial nerve. 11 days ago, a patient began experiencing severe left ear pain that he attributed to an ear infection. The question will be the seventh nerve runs in the bony canal right next to the mastoid. So is that the problem here, a lower motor nerve involvement of the facial nerve? Slurred speech could be related to facial weakness. Uh, antibiotic prescribed, offer no relief. Medical history significant for hyperlipidemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. Type 2 makes it harder, more likely to get infection from immune compromise. Patient does not smoke or consume alcohol. Blood pressure is slightly high. Pulse is normal. Physical exam shows severe facial asymmetry of the upper and lower face. So the upper and lower face both involved will be a lower motor nerve involvement of the seventh. Only lower face uh, with sparing off the upper face, upper will be an upper motor type of uh, seventh nerve involvement, so above the brain stem. Uh, so this is more of a nerve itself uh, is involved or nucleus, uh, but so far the history is going more for the nerve in the bony canal with the missed middle ear infection. Uh, eye movements are intact. Uh, that's third, fourth, and sixth. Has nothing to do with seventh. Uh, Babinski is not present, so that goes against upper motor. Since examination is normal, non-contrastity, the head reveals no abnormalities. Although CT head often also includes the seventh nerve bony canal in mastoid sinuses, which is not commented here, interestingly. So the answer should be some form of the uh, seventh nerve testing. So MRI of the brainstem with gadolinium, I'm not sure, maybe uh, looking for the seventh nerve as it enters the bony canal. Serological antibody testing, no. Anti-acetylcholine, no. Genetic testing, no. PCR, PCR of what? So this is not a good distractor. If you wanna say PCR, you wanna say which PCR of what? Polymicha is that's a technique and not the test itself. So far, not knowing what this PCR is for, I'm leaning for MRI of the brainstem. It's a seventh nerve involvement, it's a Bell's palsy. For Bell's palsy, the answer could be you can skip. Um, PCR maybe for the herpes simplex virus, but usually you don't do that. Even for Bell's palsy, usually you don't even do MRI for Bell's palsy either. But if you're not sure, then maybe MRI of the brainstem will be the answer. Let's see what the answer is. PCR. So I'm assuming that's PCR for herpes simplex virus or something like that because antibiotics didn't help. But usually that is not done uh, in a Bell's palsy patient. So I wouldn't say that's a great question, but at least uh, it is kind of good written clinical story, but I would probably rewrite the options a little better. <clears throat> So, yeah, varicella zoster virus. So, you know, virus infection, Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Uh, I would have liked to see some rash somewhere for this to be varicella zoster. Otherwise, HSV is equally likely. Although ear infections, you do think about varicella or Ramsey Hunt more, but I want to see some rash with varicella zoster. All right. Uh, reminder, uh, try, try testing out uh, quizmd.ai and try creating and generating questions there and practicing them and see what you think about it. Let me know.